Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Chorus Aviation Inc. Fourth Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. At this time, all lines are less in only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If at any time during this call you require immediate assistance, please press star zero for the operator. This call is recorded on Thursday, February 17th, 2022. I would now like to turn the conference over to Natalie McGann, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for a fourth quarter and year-end 2021 conference call and audio webcast. With me today from Chorus are Joe Randall, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Gary Osborne, Chief Financial Officer. We'll start by giving a brief overview of the results and then go on to the questions from the analyst community. Because some of the discussion in this call may be forward-looking, I direct your attention to the caution regarding forward looking statements and information which are subject to various risks, uncertainties and assumptions that are included or referenced in our management discussion and analysis of the results and operations of Chorus Aviation Inc. for the three months and year ended December 31st, 2021, the Outlook section and other sections of our MD&A where such statements appear. In addition, some of the following discussion involves certain non-GAAP financial measures including references to EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EBT, and adjusted net income. Please refer to our MD&A for a discussion relating to the use of such non-GAAP measures. I'll now turn the call over to Joe Randall. Uh, Thank you, Natalie, and good morning, everyone. 2021 was a very productive year, and I'm pleased with our accomplishments, especially considering the prolonged pandemic. We started the year by revising our Capacity Purchase Agreement, or CPA, with Air Canada that enhanced JAZZ's position as the exclusive Air Canada Express operator of 70 to 78 seat regional capacity until the end of 2025, and we added 25 Embraer 175s to the covered fleet. We are now the sole provider of Air Canada Express services, and the relationship has never been stronger. A reminder, our CPA with Air Canada continues to 2035. We strategically managed our liquidity through successful capital raises and reduced our net debt by approximately $240 million to recharge our financial flexibility. We continue to generate positive cash flow and have the resources required to focus on profitable growth. While airlines around the world are still challenged to return to pre-COVID profitability, our fourth quarter yielded positive returns of $0.06 in net earnings per basic share, or $0.12 on an adjusted basis. Our employees have shown tremendous resilience throughout this crisis and have provided safe and high-quality services to our customers. I'm deeply grateful for their perseverance and dedication. Voyager had a record year in 2021, having secured new contracts that expanded cargo operations with PureLater and developed new relationships with blue chip customers like Transport Canada, the Canadian Armed Forces, and General Dynamics Missions Canada. The team is executing very well, and the momentum they gained in the year will continue to positively impact earnings throughout 2022 and beyond. Last month, Voyager entered into an agreement with Sabina Techniques to provide on-site service support of Dash 8 400 aircraft through the Voyager's Excel program. This agreement extends our parts provisioning business into Europe, a key target market, and we're very pleased to welcome Sabina to our roster of high-quality customers. I also extend my congratulations to the team at Jazz for being recognized again this year for being named one of the best places to work in 2022 by Glassdoor Employees Choice Award. This is an award that is based solely on the input of employees who elect to provide anonymous feedback about their job, work environment, and employer. 
Given the challenges and stress many of our employees have endured over the last two years, this is an incredible testament to the positive and can-do attitude of our people. The accolades don't stop there. Jazz was also recognized in January as one of Canada's top employers for young people for the 10th consecutive year. Congratulations to the team. The Chorus Aviation Capital team has done well in a very challenging environment to support our customers and in remarketing all 13 aircraft repossessed in 2020. Quarter over quarter, we saw improvements in the overall utilization of our lease fleet and collected 83% of lease revenue recognized in the fourth quarter, up from 77% from the previous quarter. We view this as a positive sign that air travel demand is rebounding, particularly in the domestic markets where most of the lessees operate. Restrictions are gradually being lifted worldwide as more people become vaccinated and cases of COVID decline. The easing of travel and border measures announced earlier this week by the federal government is a positive step for our industry. However, more needs to be done. Thank you for listening, and now I'll turn the call over to Gary. Thank you, Joe, and good morning. Here's how the fourth quarter of this year compares to the fourth quarter of 2020. We generated adjusted EBITDA of $90.5 million, an increase of $8.5 million over the prior year. Adjusted net income was $21.5 million in this quarter, an increase of $13.8 million to $0.12 cents per basic share. The RAL segment's adjusted EBITDA increased by $5.9 million due to additional aircraft earning lease revenue and a $3.6 million lower expected credit loss provision, partially offset by lower lease revenue related to negotiated lease amendments and decreased earnings due to a lower U.S. exchange rate. The RAS segment's adjusted EBITDA increased by $2.6 million. The fourth quarter results were impacted by an increase in other revenue due to an increase in third-party MRO activities, part sales, and contract flying, an increase in capitalization of major maintenance overhauls on owned aircraft, $2.8 million, and an increase in aircraft leasing revenue under the CPA, offset by a decrease in fixed margin of $2.4 million in accordance with the CPA, and an increase in general administrative expenses attributable to increased operations. Adjusted net income of $21.5 million for the quarter, an increase of $13.8 million due to a, a five or sorry, a $8.5 million increase in adjusted EBITDA as previously described, a decrease of $5 million primarily due to a decrease in unrealized and realized foreign exchange losses a decrease in depreciation expense of $3.5 million, and an increase of $1.7 million related to gains on property and equipment and asset-backed commercial paper, offset by a $3.8 million increase in adjusted income tax expense, and an increase in net interest costs of $1.1 million. Net income increased $1 million over the prior period, primarily due to the previously noted increase in adjusted net income of $13.8 million, a decrease in impairment provisions of $27 million, offset by a decrease in net unrealized foreign exchange gains primarily on long-term debt of $35.4 million, and a decrease in income tax recoveries on adjusted items of $3.2 million. Now turning to liquidity. As of December 31, 2021, Chorus's liquidity was of $188.5 million, including cash of $123.6 million, and $64.9 million of available room on its operating credit facility. Liquidity decreased from the third quarter of 2021 by $69.6 million, primarily due to the redemption of $85 million principal amount of the 6% debentures, which was partially offset by a reduction in restricted cash. During the quarter, Corus generated cash flow from operations of $48.9 million, other key liquidity changes during the quarter include items that increase cash flow are, are as follows. An increase in security deposits and maintenance reserves of $20.1 million, a decrease in restricted cash of $14.9 million. Items that decrease cash flows are as follows. Scheduled debt repayments of $50.2 million, repayment of the prior facility of $30 million, 
capital expenditures of $18.4 million, and an increase in working capital of $17.4 million, driven by an increase in receivable from Air Canada offset by accounts payable. As of December 31, 2021, the controllable cost guardrail receivable was $44.9 million. The amount was paid in Q1 in accordance with the 2021 CPA amendment. As of December 31, 2021, CAC's gross lease receivable was $84 million. The gross receivable may increase to approximately $90 million by the end of 2022 due to rent relief arrangements and potential delays in payments. Leverage decreased year over year due to an overall reduction in net debt of approximately $240 million, partially offset by lower adjusted EBITDA of $18 million. Adjusted net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio went from 5.8 at the end of 2020 to 5.4 at the end of December 31st, 2021. Before opening the call to questions from the analyst community, I would like to acknowledge the continued outstanding efforts of our team during 2021 in a challenging and evolving operating environment. That concludes my commentary. Thank you for listening. Operator, we can open the call to questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star followed by one on your touchstone phone. You'll hear a three time prime, acknowledging your request, and your questions will be polled in the order they are received. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press star followed by two. If you're using a speaker phone, please leave the handset before pressing any keys. One moment, please, for your first question. The first question comes from Kronar Gupta with Scotia Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so my first question is uh, morning. Uh, my first question is on uh, your your ability to to reprice uh, any leasing contracts, uh, you know, perhaps annually or in the short term as interest rates increase and the market condition improves. So can you speak about you know the kind of the terms uh, or the pricing terms you can renegotiate, renegotiate or or really talk with clients? Hi, it's uh, Gary here. On the uh, aircraft leases, they're generally locked in once you sign the lease. And uh, as you can note in our disclosure, uh, about 98% of our debt is fixed uh, overall. So it's all locked and in, in, uh, works together. So once you've signed a lease, though, it is, it is locked in for the term, essentially. We do expect, with the, in an increased interest rate environment, that lease rates will uh, rise accordingly. So um, generally speaking, there's certainly a correlation between lease rates and, uh, and interest rates. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then you, you talked about uh, gross uh, lease receivable uh, increasing again uh, this year as, as uh, relief measures kind of still continue. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you can provide any visibility as to when do you think uh, that lease receivable will peak? Uh, will that be the end of this year? And uh, what's your... Uh, visibility for when do you expect that uh, receivable to be uh, collected in, in what time frame? Yeah, so uh, it's Gary here. Yes, on the receivables, you can see our disclosure on that. We still have some deferral agreements that run into next year a little bit, and that's why you're seeing uh, that guidance. Um, on the, the value, it will come down over time. It will take several years to distinguish. There's no question about that, but we're not giving the longer term guidance other than this year, and then it will take several years to distinguish the receivables. Perfect. Uh, that's all my question. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Matthew Lee with Canaccord. Please go ahead. Morning, and congrats on the quarter. Um, I'd like to first ask about the options you've got to expand the leasing portfolio. Uh, you know, specifically, do you have a preference between acquiring assets, signing individual agreements, or maybe buying a competitor in the space? Yeah, um, you know, generally speaking, we've been focused more um, on new sale and leaseback type of opportunities, uh, but we're certainly not uh, totally focused on that. We look at all opportunities, including, um, you know, midlife aircraft um, and, uh, in some cases, older assets. Um, as you know, we do have options as they come to end of life with our uh, our, our diversified business, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we continue to talk with airlines, other leasing companies in terms of sourcing potential opportunities there where they're looking to uh, diversify or, or to uh, divest a part of their portfolio, et cetera. So, um, you know, we have a broad spectrum 
Um, and um, so we'll continue to we'll continue to do that. That's, that's great. And then maybe can you unpack the opportunities you're seeing in cargo? Uh, you know, obviously the pure later contract is a great start, but uh, do you see that becoming mm -hmm. a more meaningful part of the business going to 2022 and beyond? Yeah, we certainly look to for that to be a growing part of the business. Uh, you know, I think we're very pleased with our relationship with Pure Later. Uh, it's been going very well. Um, so, you know, we we see that as an exciting opportunity for us. Uh, you know, we have converted some of our older Dash 8 passenger aircraft into freighters, and we do have a number of them available to do so. Um, but again, it's a, it's a, you know, it's related to the demand that we see. But uh, you know we do see it as um, as a growing part of our business and certainly opportunity there, and we're making good progress. It's not a huge part of our business, but we'll continue to pursue it as a growth opportunity. All right, thanks. Thank you. Your next question comes from David Ocampo with Cormac Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. On your future leasing revenue, uh, kind of assuming no 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 new assets here, sh should we see growth in the, in the upcoming quarters as as repossessed aircraft are, are redeployed, or or is this going to be offset by uh, the leases that you renegotiated? Uh, specifically, um, Aero Mexico comes to mind. Um, so it's Gary here, David. I think you you'll see it be you know pretty steady, maybe a modest increase, um, but it should be pretty steady. Most of the aircraft are back out now. Um, as you know, they were remarketed during the course of the year, so there's a little bit of a time lag that you will see uh, throughout there. In Aero Mexico is now uh, emerged from bankruptcy or, or very close to it, and we should see a, a small uptick there. So steady to a small uptick. Okay, and, and you guys noted the, the bankruptcy of, of Philippine Airlines, then coming out of Chapter 11. But kind of when you look at you know your remaining customers, are, are you aware of any other airlines that may be on the brink or or are in financial hardship right now? No, I think uh, I think the whole environment has improved, uh, frankly, around the world with respect to carriers. Um, you know, and we've redone agreements with most of them, and those agreements are sticking. Um, you know, there are still a couple of areas of the world which are struggling a little, but um, you know, we certainly believe that the worst is behind us. And um, you know, so and of course we've taken some provisions, uh, as you know, in our financials, et cetera, which we think uh, very well cover us uh, in terms of where we are. Okay, then my, my last one here is for Gary. When I take a look at the, your, the leasing business's operating expenses after you strip out those one-time costs, it looks like it only came in at around two million dollars in the quarter, and, and that's lower than than basically anything that. That's, that, that you guys have done over the last, you know, eight or ten quarters or so. I was just curious if there's any one-time benefits in there, or is this a new number that we should expect going forward? Um, there's nothing that sticks out. I think uh, when you look at the quarter, you're starting to see the, the um, benefits of getting the aircraft back on lease and, and whatnot. So, you know, when you look at the overall results, I think, you know, the, the quarter's not a bad uh, taken off spot, particularly with the revenue and, and whatnot. So. And I guess in the past, Gary, you guys have mentioned that you're, you target like an SG&A percentage of revenue. Of, I forget what the number was. It was seven or ten percent. Is, is is that still the right number going forward? Well, it, I think if you look at where the SG&A is year to date, it's going to be higher as a percentage, just as we briefly, you know, repositioned our fleet. And then as we grow, you know, we would want to get below ten percent for sure. Uh, in, you know, in the next uh, number of uh, quarters, but it's going to take time to grow into that. The, the infrastructure is still there. It's just uh, if you go back and look, we've we've taken some hits on the revenue, and we've adjusted now for that. And moving forward, as we grow, we'll we'll get back to something of more of a normal. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you. Your next question comes from Team James with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yep. Quick question on the uh, the Air Canada trade receivable was was uh, I realize it fluctuates around quarter to quarter. Um, but it was up a fair bit more than it was at the end of 2020. Is, is there a particular reason um, for that? Uh, the guardrail was uh, it's Gary here. The guardrail was pretty uh, significant there in the quarters. You saw in her disclosure. 
So uh, as you know, it's a $20 million cap, so it grew a fair bit in the quarter, and that's what uh, the bulk of that would be uh, that you saw. And then, of course, that was paid here in Q1. And so it reset itself to zero. And, and so, Gary, just to, so I understand correctly, the guardrail receivable is included in that disclosure that you have on the total, I guess, total Air Canada trade receivable. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. Uh, if you're looking at the financial statements in the back? Or? Yeah, yeah, just the, the number. I think it was, I mean, it was certainly, it, it include, must include more, I believe, than the, the, the guardrail receivable, but I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Uh, it should be included so that, there. So that significant change in it from year end to year end was, would be related to the, the guardrail component of it specifically. That that certainly built up in the uh, end of the quarter. The other thing is there's normal receivables that make their way through there, whatever they may be, so um, related to the operation, but uh, the, the guardrail is a significant component of it. Okay, okay. Um, my next question, just on your 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 new aircraft acquisition uh, plans for for 2022, and, and you've indicated kind of three to four hundred million. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment at all on any particular aircraft types that you think look particularly attractive this year, or where there may be opportunities, whether it's by OEM or by you know jet versus turboprop. Uh, size, any kind of defining characteristics that you, you you see as you look out to the balance of the year? Right. Well, you know, I think we've been saying all along that we find the larger regional jets to be particularly attractive um, and sort of the crossover aircraft, which are the A220s, I think the E2s uh, in particular. Um, you know, the turboprops are taking a while to pick up the surplus that's in the market, although you may have seen recently that uh, ATR is going to be upping uh, its uh, production and actually moving more into the freighter side as well, which is, which is interesting. So, um, you know, and of course, the 75-seat jets are generally still in good demand, especially, you know, in the U.S., et cetera. So, uh, but of course, those would be primarily used assets uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, I think what's particularly interesting are the new, um, the new generation regional jets on the larger side, you know, over 100 feet. Maybe if I could just follow on to that, just in particular, the, the, the A220, there's, there's been more, more activity in demand yeah. for, for new aircraft recently. Um, you, you know, courses tip their toe in, in the water there with, with a few aircraft. Um, do, you, do you think that is something that continues to grow in proportion or have a, an increasing contribution to lease revenue for Chorus, or is it a bit of a, a more competitive market, or is there any dynamic that, that maybe makes it less uh, attractive? Well, it's certainly a competitive market. Um, there's no question about it, but I do see it becoming a larger part going forward. And, you know, you have these uh, mid-range airlines that are operating and looking to move to these new technology, larger regional jets. And, um, you know, those would be in particular in our target group. Um, you know, when you look at huge buys from large carriers, um, you know, quite often that's the, the ground that the larger leasing companies play in. But, you know, in, that, in this particular market, I think we'll be more of a niche player, but uh, there are clearly carriers that are moving in that direction that would fit the type of carrier profile that we would target. Uh, you know, as you can see, we have five airplanes with Air Baltic there, and Air Baltic is, a, you know, a great example of a, of a, of a niche player that's, uh, you know, been very successful, very supported in its home market, et cetera. So, um, you know, and there are other opportunities such as those that we would pursue. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Now is the perfect time to work at Amazon. They are offering hourly jobs with great pay and even include a large sign-on bonus. No matter where you're at in the job market, you can select from a variety of available roles in your area. Join an exciting work environment and be part of a team that brings smiles to customers every day. To find the job that works for you and some extra cash, go to Amazon.com apply.
That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. A fortune forecast update brought to you by the Ohio Lottery. Well, hey there, Ohio. We're tracking a lot of jackpot activity over the next few days. We have rolling cash five and lucky for life in the forecast the entire week. But we also have major drawings for Powerball moving in, followed by scattered Mega Millions drawings through the week with some classic lotto drawings popping up here and there as well. There are big drawings every day, so stay tuned to the Fortune Forecast Center for the latest jackpot developments. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly. Thank you. Your next question comes from Walter Spracklin with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Good morning, everyone, and and congratulations on those recognitions. I know in the airline industry, it's a tough uh, uh, tough one through COVID to to get recognized that way, so so congratulations. uh, moving on to the questions, and, and really I have two, uh, and they're core to kind of our view on, on, on your company. And the first one is that, you know, as we go through uh, the, what, what I hope is the tail end of, of COVID, um, you know, we are going to see a, a pickup in, 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 in activity, uh, and it's going to be first and foremost in, in the short haul uh, regional friend and family. Uh, on your results, the fourth quarter suggested that, but now your guidance on Q1, uh, obviously down due to Omicron. My sense is, and I, you know, and I hope that Omicron is is kind of just, uh, you know, a temporary aspect in your financials, and that the second quarter and forward, in fact, uh, come back um, uh, along the lines of what we were seeing last fall. When you look at your your booking curve, uh, is is that supportive or contradictory to that view? Is my question. Okay, uh, that's a very good question, um, Walter. And you know, our our equivalent to a booking curve is the number of block hours we fly, uh, because um, you know we we don't have, as you know, Air Canada has the commercial side of the business in terms of load factors and bookings, et cetera, and that all translates uh, to us in terms of block hours flown. And I, I think I, I do have some numbers that I can share with you that I think clearly demonstrates pretty much what you're talking about. In the fourth quarter last year, when you compare it to pre-pandemic in 2019, we operated about 75% of the block hours we did pre-pandemic. So it was definitely up, the fourth quarter was going well, et cetera, and then Omicron struck. And it looks as though from what we've actually flown, and we're starting to see some pickup numbers even in March, that the first quarter now we'll be at about 60% of where we were pre-pandemic. So obviously it had fallen, and you know when we look at our numbers, that was the impact of the pandemic, of the Omicron, I should say. And then though, when we look at the second quarter of this year, we're looking at actually the hours that we're planning on right now are about 87% of uh, pre-pandemic. So you can see that while there is a drop um, in the first quarter as a result of M- Omicron, I think there's reason to believe that now things are going to pick back up and we're going to get to where we were pre-Omicron and plus. So um, I think those numbers will give you some indication that um, you know, in terms of our outlook, yeah, first quarter, not so great because of these block hours, but definitely recovery. And the other thing, you know, to remind people of as well is that we're paid to fix them out, um, and it really doesn't matter how many block hours. And, of course, uh, while we watch this carefully because it's, it's sort of a bellwether of how the industry is going, um, it doesn't necessarily all then manifest itself in our results. Uh, you know which are which are generally fixed. Okay, that that is excellent uh, excellent uh, information. I think uh, exactly what I was looking for. So thank you for that, Joe. That's that's perfect. On, on the second part of you know our view, and and again I'll I'll kind of frame the question the same way. It's our view that um, you know stretched balance sheets among airlines will not allow them to go out and and kind of buy up aircraft left, right, and center, and perhaps leasing will be an opportunity they use in, in uh, perhaps in, and likely in their early early months and quarters and years uh, to, to, to ramp up quickly and to, 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 uh, to be able to ramp up at all, quite, quite frankly, uh, given their stretch balance sheet. 
Um, obviously, you got to get your, your collections back first, and the trend there is good. Uh, you know what we've seen in the last three quarters. You've you've highlighted a few wins here, uh, but I guess my question is the same thing: is when you look at your sales channel in that in that segment, um, are are we getting to a point where you can look down the road and say? hey, uh, that is true, airlines are going to be leasing a lot and probably perhaps and likely more than they did pre-pandemic. And is there any visibility that you you have that could confirm or deny that kind of that kind of view? Yeah, I, I think I think what you're saying is very true. I think more airlines will do this with their damaged balance sheets, et cetera. A lot of them have been pretty cautious in terms of adding new aircraft or capacity, et cetera. And there are some aircraft to absorb in the marketplace that were grounded as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. I think what we're seeing, though, is we've seen more or less, um, especially in the regional side, maybe not totally in the narrow body, wide body, but in the regional side, there's been, I think, a little bit of a shoring up over this last little while on some of the lease rates that we're seeing out there. And some of the reports that we're seeing shows that you know, it, it has, in fact, bottomed out. So I think we're going to see the increase. And, you know, this is barring any unforeseen um, another variant or a world crisis or something like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there will be that uptake or uptick. And, um, you know, we are getting inbound inquiries from, from airlines now looking to do, uh, you know, more leasing business, et cetera. So, so very good signs of, of recovery in the market. Okay, that, that's great information, Joe. I really appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Cameron Borkson with National Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Um, you know, I, I obviously there's been some press reports out there regarding potential m and I appreciate that, that you're not going to uh, comment specifically on those reports, but maybe a bigger picture uh, question for you just with regards to, you know, what if you were to pursue the M&A route to grow your portfolio, you know, what, what potential synergies do you see or strategic advantage would there be for your leasing business to have that greater scale uh, maybe just comment on sort of the, you know, more generically on what the potential upside could be to the business if, if you were to pursue that route. Yeah, like we said, you know, we're not going to respond on speculation and, and that sort of thing. However, you know, I, I think it it makes sense that more scale brings advantages um, in terms of a larger leasing platform with manufacturers, with financing, larger orders, um, you know, things of that nature. Um, you know, there's there's been dislocation in the market um, for sure with some of the larger lessors. Um, you know, there's still a lot of assets out there to be picked up, and there are, there's no shortage of rumors and speculation. But um, you know, and and you know, we're certainly keeping our eye on all these things and looking for opportunities uh, that make sense for Chorus, and we, you know, we'll continue to do that. But uh, um, you know, and through that, we would bring and look to bring in some of the advantages that could come from, uh, you know, from any possibility. So we continue to look at it. No comment at this point because, you know, there's there's a lot of speculation, but we'll just keep it at that. And do you, do you think it, it matters to an airline who they're leasing from? I mean, is it, you know, do they do they prefer to deal with a bigger lessor versus maybe a smaller player or does it make any difference to them? I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Obviously, larger lessors can do bigger deals. In some cases, larger airlines don't want to do a whole bunch of small deals. But, you know, we have leases with large airlines as well. So uh, a lot of it is relationship-based. Um, you know, it's who you know in the industry and getting in there and getting in the, uh, in the competitive process. And, um, you know, so a lot of it is, is driven by that. But, you know, we're, our, our focus has been primarily not on the very, very large carriers, uh, but on the, the mid to uh, smaller side. And um, we're, we're quite comfortable in that niche. Okay, no, great. Um, uh, maybe just a, a quick second question. 
uh, you've got a number of aircraft uh, there that uh, will be available for part out. Um, just wondering what you're seeing in the, in the part out market. I mean, obviously, airlines around the world are starting to fly a little more. I mean, is there is there some acceleration of demand for, for part out opportunities here? Yeah, there has been some acceleration of demand, and we continue to part out aircraft. So we're very pleased with that business. Um, and, um, you know, we see it as a, as a good part of our business going forward. And it really, um, you know, it really helps uh, when we look at the whole life cycle of the aircraft, which is what we've been talking about for a while. And we do have a number of older airplanes sitting there, and we look at each as a part out opportunity. And we have done a number, and we'll continue to do it. So there's good demand in that area, and uh, we see that uh, recovering as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from Kevin Chiang with CIBC. Please go ahead. Th thanks for taking my question. Um, j just looking at uh, some, of the, I guess some of the growth spend you're looking at within uh, within your leasing business. I guess how much of this is 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 uh, you know you you looking at uh, you know more sustainable recovery in the aviation space uh, versus you know, maybe taking advantage from a market that seems to be a little bit more advantageous for you. So uh, I look at like Nordic Aviation seems to be facing significant issues. Is, is there like a market share grab opportunity here that that this window's opened and and that's and that's driving maybe more aggressive a more aggressive stance for you to to take advantage of, of maybe where your competitors sit today? Yeah, well, market share for us is secondary. You know, what we do is we look at each deal in terms of of the um, you know the the financial aspects of of the deal, the credit worthiness of the customer, and of course what we've been balancing that all against is our own liquidity as we move through here and our own balance sheet, et cetera. So um, you know while market share is nice to have, uh, you know we've seen some large lessors with major market share that have not been successful. So, um, you know, we're being very prudent and very careful. That's the best way I can describe it, I think. And, and, and is it a, I mean, for lack of a better word, is, is, is it a buyer's market for you? You know, for example, like Nordic, uh, you know, I think they wrote down like a third of their asset portfolio. I, I think they're going to look to sell planes, which I suspect, you know, they're not in a great negotiating position. You know, so as a buyer of these aircraft, are, are you finding – you know, that to be more compelling from an economic perspective so that even though lease rates might be a little bit challenged here, you're, you're still getting that, that ROE that, 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 that you typically target? Yeah, well, you know, whenever there are buying opportunities, you have to look at the asset, you have to look at the deployment of the asset because, you know, if you buy these assets and you don't have a home for them, then it ties up a lot of cash. And there are a lot of surplus assets out there right now. Um, so in each case, you also have to look at if they're coming with leases attached, uh, how long the lease is, quality of the carrier again, and you know there are some credits that are out there that have very much struggled and continue to do so. So we need to be very very careful. And while they are buy opportunities, what we don't want to do is take on um, you know some of these opportunities and then they become problems. We want to make sure whenever we act on something like this that we have we have a plan. And maybe just last one for me. You know, when you think of, you know, when you think of growing the portfolio, and I and I think of maybe your strategy pre-pandemic. It was it was you know trying to be diverse across you know geographies, across aircraft type, across uh, across customers, and obviously that makes sense when you're building a portfolio. But I think. There's going to be an uneven, to state the obvious, there's going to be an uneven recovery in the aviation market when you look at region by region. Does that does that kind of, you know, shape how you want your portfolio to be? Like, do you, do you try to limit aircraft that, or your exposure to maybe Asia Pacific, which is expected to lag in the recovery? You know, is your preference to put more planes into, the, say, North America and Europe, where the recovery might be faster? Just, you know, is, is, yeah. is there a little bit more thoughtfulness? Like, oh, I won't say thoughtfulness, but is there maybe a little bit more? Uh, more focus on maybe what geographies you, you want in your portfolio as as the overall market recovers. Yeah, generally speaking, you know, we've, uh, it's great. Diversification is wonderful, um, all things being equal, but all things are not necessarily equal in terms of geographies and um, and carriers. So, 
you know, we're we're cautious if something is struggling and you know it looks as though it's going to take some time, then we'll look at that extra carefully. Uh, but of course, if it's a geography or a carrier that is robust and has come back pretty quickly, um, you know, um, we'll we'll look at that opportunity more favorably. So, you know, in the short term, as the world has an uneven recovery and carriers are uneven, um, you know, we'll we'll tend to go more to where the the real um, you know the floor is is there and we're comfortable with the investment. So, um, and as I said. You know, some of these continue to struggle. So we're not parts of the world. We're certainly not out of it yet. I don't think the world is, but uh, it's headed in the right direction. That's, that's, uh, that's very helpful for me. Thank you very much for taking my question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a final reminder, should you have any questions, please press star 1. Okay, operator, it seems there are no questions, so we will conclude the call. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference call for today. We thank you for participating and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Winter can wreak havoc on your skin. Hey, it's Kayla, and it's not just the weather, but as a new mom, I've seen my skin change in ways that I'm not too happy about. But that's where the Skin Center has you covered. Their most popular treatment is Botox because they're the best at it. They've been ranked a top 10 provider in the nation by Allergan Aesthetics, the makers of Botox. And their best facial is what I got. It's the Hydra Facial. It exfoliates, extracts, and hydrates all at once. So save your skin from these winter blues and DM at the Skin Center MD on Instagram and mention code Kayla to get one hundred dollars off your first botox or filler treatment or any skincare package at kroger we believe in higher standards for fresh so we do up to a 27 point inspection on our produce like for oranges we check for scarring and sunburn allowing only the best produce to reach our shelves because when it comes to fresh for everyone we believe the juice is worth the squeeze kroger fresh for everyone and now you'll find more ways to save on your favorites. When you download digital coupons, you can use up to five times in one transaction. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.